So welcome to the Hack My Age podcast and Zoom webinar. For the next hour, we are speaking with pharmacologist and medical medical grade biohacker Phil Mikens about peptides and their clinical results from improving our eyesight to hormonal and immunity regulation and even telomere extension. So Phil Mikens has a master's and bachelor's degrees in food and vitamin technology, pharmacy and biochemistry. He's been actively involved in anti-aging medicine since the late 1980s. <laughs> and he has contributed to numerous books, magazines, radio, and TV shows on various subjects connected to healthy aging. So currently, he's now the editor in chief of the Aging Matters magazine, the assistant editor to the Lifespan Medicine Journal, which has been founded by Thierry Hertog, uh, who I will be attending his webinar coming up soon if anybody wants details on that. On female hormones coming up and director Phil is also the director to the British Longevity Society. He also advises the Stromboli Conference on Cancer and Aging and the London Anti-Aging Conference. This guy's got a lot, he's done a lot. So Phil has dedicated himself to studying the latest research about anti-aging medicine and helping to make available innovative products to health professionals as well as their patients. And he's proud to be part of one of the world's leading organizations in anti-aging medicine and keenly interested in the orthomolecular approach to medicine. Phil has firmly believes that anti-aging medicine is the ultimate form of preventative and regenerative medicine, and that it will be the next major leap in the health of mankind. In 1991, he also became a co-founder of the IAS Group, the International Anti-Aging Systems. And this is an organization dedicated to the dissemination of preventative and regenerative medicine information and the supply of really hard to obtain health products. So without further ado, welcome, Phil. Hello, everybody. It's great to be with you and Zora today. And um, I hope you're not going to get too perturbed by my British accent. And uh, I shall try and use Americanisms wherever possible. <laughs> and um, <laughs> but if I may ask Zora, can we just uh, share the screen, please? Yes, let me go. I think you have access, so go for it. Jolly good. Thank you very much. I think that's the one we're going to start with. Can we all see Hack Your Aging with Peptides? Okay. Mm -hmm. Who wants to see it? Yep, good. Then we shall, we shall move on. Um, so I won't talk any more about myself because um, Zora has done that very eloquently for me. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, this is what we want. This is just a general pictorial about growth and aging um, and the one, two, three, four, five, these first five stages of life, we're probably not too worried about, right? I mean, not too many issues going into a nice adulthood. It's this one here that we want to avoid. It's this decrepitation, this degeneration, this common uh, aspect of aging that people are so concerned about. What we want to do is prevent this, if at all possible, that's the ultimate. But if we happen to wander off into this state, then how do we regenerate ourselves, rejuvenate ourselves? Wow, that's the most powerful word in the world, uh, into this state, into being a healthy adult. Um, I've always maintained that anti-aging medicine, the word medicine, is, is not just aesthetics. You know, whilst it might be lovely that we all want to look like Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt, <laughs> well, without the tattoos anyway, uh, but but it'd be nice to look like that but perhaps more importantly it's being able to perform and I think if you ask any very elderly person dare I say senile person what they want out of life if, if you said would you like to be lucid agile and independent the answer would always be yes so in my goal that's the main goal we want to be lucid we keep our marbles we want to be agile. We want to be able to move about and do, do what normal life things. And of course, independent. We don't really want to be helped to the bathroom, do we? Yeah. So <laughs> that's that to me is the fundamental goal. Everything else that we can achieve is icing on the cake. But to me, that's the core. So I just put that out there. Can I ask you um, yeah. to press the little button on the top 
left hand part of the screen to show the full slide. Oh yes, you want to see the full thing, of left, course. Yeah. Right, of course. It's all the way to the left, more or less. There is it slideshow? From the current slide on the. Oh, there we are. From current slide, indeed. Yeah. How's that? Let's see. Yeah, that's that's better. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So I can't see you guys now, so I'll just have to listen to your voices. <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll let you know when we have questions. So you guys, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Thank you. So we could go off and we could spend a long time talking about some of the major theories of aging. You know, there are literally dozens and dozens of major theories and hundreds if, of other minor ones as well. And I'm not adverse to talking about significantly increased lifespans. Of course, the significantly increased lifespan has to be accompanied with decent health. I mean, I think we'd all agree on that. But if we keep our feet on the ground for today, we can note from history that humans can definitely live to 110 to 120 years. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, Many of us, many of the averages around the world, and they do vary quite widely from country to country, the average is male, male and female, maybe 75, 80, 85. Mm -hmm. So what about this extra 30, 40 years? Can we, this, this latter part of life, is it not possible to achieve this uh, in, in a reasonable health? And why do some people live this long and others don't? Mm -hmm. what, what is the secret to this? Is it just their genes? just the environment they're brought up. So, you know, these are big questions. And um, this is a, a schematic to basically show that this area is, is an extra sort of 30, 40%. And as we'll come to find out, there's a very uncanny number that the Russians, because what we're going to talk about today is principally Russian research, um, that the every cell seems to have this biological reserve of 30 to 40 percent. How uncanny that yeah. that is the amount of life that we could have over the average lifespan. So it's I find it very strange that those numbers are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem I think a lot of people have is, you know, with aging and they said a lot of I me, mean, a lot of people say, don't I don't want to live to 100 because they imagine it's poor health. So the key is to how can we live even even as it is if you live to 85, mm. those last 30 years are kind of shit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This, and this is why people don't want to go there. But of course, this is a fundamental shift in thinking that you say, hang on a minute, you know, you're not going to be decrepit and senile at 85, 95. You, let's, let's assume for a moment you can be a healthy 50-year-old. You know, isn't that, isn't that okay? Oh, well, I'd like to be a healthy 25-year-old, if I'm perfectly yeah. honest. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, 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 small steps as it were but I think most people would probably accept yeah healthy 50 when I'm 90 100 110 that sounds okay you know again I'm lucid I'm agile I'm independent so yeah. that, that's not a bad step in the right direction um uh there, as I say there's many variances in in ages across the across the group we we could I've got a another slide a bit later on of uh, which we could come to the Greek god, a uh, Greek mythology. There was a man called Titonus, and he was a man, and he did great work for the gods. And they said to him at the end, "What would you like as your reward?" And of course, he asked for uh, immortality, and they granted him it. But guess what happened to him? He got older and older and older and older, and more decrepit and more decrepit. And eventually, apparently, he, he sort of black and shriveled up. And he got so small, he even disappeared from, from sight. But he's still alive. Oh, right? be careful what you wish for. Exactly, be careful what you wish for. He was asking the gods for the wrong thing. Of course, he should have asked for eternal youth. He asked for the wrong thing. So just a little, you're absolutely right. Living longer has to go hand in glove with living healthily. Mm -hmm. so that, that's an, perhaps an obvious statement. One of the... Um, interesting aspects, and there are many aspects, of course, to aging, is the rapid decrease in protein synthesis. So here we can see on this chart that when we're 20 to 30, we have very significant levels of protein synthesis. When we're in our 50s and 60s, 
it's more or less halved from yeah. when we were in our 20s. And of course, by the time we're over 80, it's halved again. So the ability of the body to produce proteins is a fundamental part of the body being able to regenerate and repair itself. Mm. So this is a major factor. So could we improve the ability of our bodies to improve the protein synthesis? This perhaps is a key question. And as we'll see, it does go in with this research about these peptides. Why aren't we producing proteins uh, as well? Why is it half as much? Is it, is, it, is it something that's genetic? Is it something that's we're not eating enough protein? Is it because we're more sedentary or combination? Yeah. I'd be honest with you, or I think it's all of the above. Um, as we'll see, uh, although we can all uh, be pessimistic and say, oh God, I wish I'd chosen my parents um, because they've given me bad genes. Um, and there is some aspects to that. And some people are lucky and they get given good genes. But as we'll see, um, genes are, is a good expression. Genealogists have a good expression. And they say, consider genes to be a gun. Um, and that's your gun. But the environment that you expose the genes to, in other words, your diet, your lifestyle, etc., that, if you do a bad one, will pull the trigger. Mm. Okay? But if you don't expose those genes to the wrong environment, you won't pull the trigger. Mm. So that's a bit of good news, really. That's, that's epigenetics. Yeah. And that's something we'll, we'll definitely get into. So I probably don't need to tell you who the man on the left is. <laughs> <That's> like... <laughs> I think you probably all recognize him. Um, but the man on the right, is Professor Vladimir Kavinson. And he is receiving an award here from President Putin for his work that he has under him, he and his team have undertaken over decades at the uh, Biogerontology Institute, which is based in the beautiful city of St. Petersburg in Russia. So a quick thing about uh, Professor Kavinson. Um, when he was he was in the military and in the 1980s in the early 80s he was a colonel in the kgb military and he received of course we're talking now of the soviet union um not not today as russia <laughs> and uh and he got a call one day from the kremlin and the kremlin said to him we want you to investigate a methods in which our troops can be improved. And, and basically he said, well, what do you mean? And, he, and they said, well, certain of our troops, troops that sit in nuclear submarines, uh, troops that sit by uh, nuclear missiles in silos uh, are, are deteriorating fast. Their health is deteriorating. They have literally got accelerated aging. That may not be the biggest surprise in the world when you consider that who wants to sit too close to a nuclear reactor, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also they wanted, uh, for their elite forces, they wanted methods that would keep their, <clears throat> their health, their physical condition, their mental condition, working at the highest possible level. And on top of that, they said there are new weapons that the American military had developed, one of which, for example, was a laser that, uh, thankfully it's never been deployed, but these are things unfortunately do exist, where a laser would be shone onto the battlefield and any troop seeing it would be blinded. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to find methods that would recover any such damages. Mm -hmm. So he had enormous um, resources at his disposal. He told me personally that he said, Phil, if we tried to do this today in modern Russia, we couldn't do it. We don't have the money, that the resources aren't there. He said, but when it was the Soviet Union, and because I had received instructions directly from the Kremlin, I can pick the phone up and I can ask for anything, hmm. absolutely anything, and it would be with me tomorrow. Wow. So they had a huge thing. Now they went down some blind alleys that, you know, they didn't come to the conclusion straight away. But what they basically found out and what this um, webinar is really about today is they found out that short chain peptides, and we'll tell you about what they are in a moment, that are found in foods, in different foods, act as gene switches. And I first heard 
uh, Professor Cavinson lecture. I think it was, I was trying to think today what the day was. I think it was around 2010, maybe, maybe 2009. And I'd gone to Istanbul to, you know, to a conference and he was lecturing and he described what I'm about to describe to you. And it doesn't very happen very often in life. And there are amazing moments when we have them. But after he'd finished, it was like a tea break. And I didn't go. I sat there on my seat whilst everyone went off to, you know, have their coffee, etc. I just sat there on my seat, spellbound with what I just heard. And it was an epiphany. It was, you know, if, if I'd been a cartoon, there would have been a light bulb <laughs> over my head, I guess. Um, and I thought, I had, honestly, I, honestly, at that moment in time, I thought, I'll be honest with you. I thought, well, either this is bullshit or this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my career. And thankfully, I can say I think it is the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my career, as we'll come to. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you what it is. Sometimes in life, we need an experience to trigger another one that comes from our past. And I went back at that moment in 2009 when I saw him. I went back to 1981. And I remember being in the London College learning nutrition. In, or didn't even call it nutrition then. They called it food and vitamin technology, would you believe? But there you go. Um, and I remember the professor put up on the uh, on the board, he put a pie chart. And uh, on this pie chart, it had a breakdown of food. It, and they basically said, this is what you find in food. This is typically what you find. And basically, there was an X percentage of vitamins, an X percentage of minerals, an X percentage of oils. I prefer to call them oils than fats. Saves a lot of confusion with people. Fats don't make you fat. Um, <laughs> And but most of it was fiber. I think about 55 or 60 percent of, of this pie chart was fiber. 1981, remember, I sat there as a student and I remember thinking, wow, either fiber is a lot more important than we give it credit for. And, and in 1981, we weren't giving fiber a lot of credit or they've missed something. They've missed something that's in food that isn't in this chart. So. Fast forward to 2009 and my first hearing of Professor Cavinson. I, I should tell you, by the way, this research was a Soviet military secret. Hmm. Right. They've got stacks of paper, stacks of research. They, they've dosed it millions of times. But this information only started coming out to the West in in about the mid 2000s. But okay, wait, so how did you even get into this conference back then? Because it was the Soviet Union. You would have been classified as a spy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how, was it just Glasnost and Perestroika? Well, don't forget when I was learning about it, it was at the end of the 2000s. So oh, I wasn't privy oh, okay. to it during Soviet Union. I think I think in a heavy Russian accent, you could have said, Phil, I can tell you this information, but after I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> What, what year we, we went to this conference? What was it? Oh, it was one of the anti-aging conferences that I go to. I, what year? Um, it was about 2009. Oh, okay. So then it's already, I thought it was yeah. pre, had 1981 in my head for some reason. Okay. Right, right. I mean, okay, you can argue, is Istanbul in the east or is it in the west? Uh, it, I think we were on the right side of the Bosphorus, so we were in the west. Um, but, you know... He hasn't spoken much in the West about this. Uh, you know, I've met him in Stockholm where he's lectured. I've met him in Geneva where he's lectured. Um, but he hasn't made many lectures in the West, in West Europe. And as far as I'm aware, he's made none in the United States today. That's not to say his publications and the books aren't out there. But this information, although it's becoming better known, is still not well known. That, that's, that's the bottom line. Even though the Russians have been dabbling with this for 40 years, mm. right? So don't let anyone say to you, oh, it's all new, we don't know, we, what about safety, what about side effects? We've got 40 years of research to go back on. It's a, it's a really big file. Mm. So, um, so like I say, it was an epiphany. So my, my magic moment was thinking back to that pie chart on the wall and suddenly realizing, yes, I asked myself that question on that day, They've missed something in food. They've missed the fact that there are peptides in food that act as gene switches. Mm. Okay, so that that's the message I want to get 
over there. Um, so this is it in a nutshell. Can I um, ask you, can I yes. interrupt for just a second? Please. There is a question before we get too far away from the slide. Uh, the one that you showed about protein synthesis decreases mm -hmm. with aging, mm -hmm. where does this data come from? That is one of the public, one of the Russian publications. So I didn't put all the references up on these slides, but at the end, I can point you to websites and books where you can get all these references if you want to see them. Okay. All right, Amy, does that answer your question? And we can get you, you can even like kind of list the ones that you want and we can try to find yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. Amy? Oh, she muted herself. It's okay. Yeah, that sounds great, Zora. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, this in a nutshell is basically showing how these peptides, and I'll explain in a moment because there are literally thousands and thousands of peptides out there. And we are talking about some very specific ones here today, and I will explain that in a moment. But basically, it shows you how they're at the center, how they act as gene switches for DNA, how they can actually induce protein synthesis. OK, and like I say, there are literally dozens of studies and we'll, I'll be highlighting some of them today uh, to show that their methodology of action. And also the fact, very interestingly, that these short chain peptides can be digested. In other words, if you swallow them, they will pass into blood. OK, and they've done all the studies on that. And it, I, I could uh, make a comment. Or maybe it's time to make that comment now. OK, let's make it now. Um, <laughs> can I um, ask you before you start, is there any way we can make the slide slightly bigger? Oh, uh, I don't know if I can because I've got it on full screen here. You do, because it seems as though, because we can see what next slide is coming up. And, oh, and that's weird. I, I, wonder if I don't know about everybody else, but my eyes are, are good, but they're not that good. <laughs> it could be that I'm using dual screens, I think. I'd, I'm using, I'd love to well, see. I've got them. over here because I'm using my laptop here, and it could be picking it up from my laptop. So there must be a little button. Um, I, I don't know if it's one of those icons at the bottom. If anybody here know, has used this or knows, what to do? Let me. Know. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to come out for a moment. On the top. Now, well, I don't suppose that's helped. No, that was the old, the old version. Yeah. Um, Go back to slide. Yeah, and then it's kind of like there should that's be right. a, there should be. See the t display settings in the very top. It says display settings, and then there's a little arrow. In between show taskbar, display settings, and end slides, your very top of your screen. Yeah, mine's at the bottom, actually. What do you want me oh, to do? It says display settings. Um, and I'm, there's, I'm just wondering what, if you clicked on it, what what it would show. I don't know. Um, okay. Toggle. No. Sorry, I'm not brilliant no, on okay. Zoom. I, I just, I know there must be, but see, well, can you go to the top? See I'll, tell you what we, I'll tell you what we can do, Zora. I'll yeah. be very happy to give you this presentation at the end. And okay. if you want to upload it, and then guys can go back and look at it at their leisure. Sure. Is that a good idea? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So very quickly, you know, a lot of people understand that if you eat a steak, let's say, um, that the protein, which is very heavy in proteins, that that protein doesn't get into the blood. It gets broken down. And, and it's all, oh, we'll say it's a waste of time. It will just be destroyed in the stomach acid. What a waste of time. But the question is, if you're a bodybuilder, it's, and you're, uh, let me put it this way, if you're a natural bodybuilder, mm -hmm. one of the aspects is you would eat a lot of steak or you'd eat a lot of salmon or you'd eat a lot, you'd, you'd eat a lot of meat with, with heavy in protein. So how come these guys and girls can muscle up when they're eating steaks that allegedly is all, all the protein in them is being destroyed in the stomach? Doesn't make sense. Well, it does if you then understand that in the stomach, the protein is broken down into short chain peptides. Short chain peptides cross into blood and through this mechanism, they induce protein synthesis. 
Mm. So you're, you're getting peptides out of the steak. Even though it's protein on your plate, it will be peptides in your blood. Mm. So that helps to explain that anomaly, which has been an anomaly for quite some time. How much, so, how much do you absorb as peptides? Well, that's going to be highly variable on okay. um, what kind of steak, how much, uh, how you've cooked it, uh, all, all that kind of thing. It will, it will vary very widely okay. um, and, and the kind of meat that you might be eating. Um, my understanding is that fish and beef are the best. So, and in fact, the natural peptides are sourced from, from cows, they're bovine in origin. Mm. Uh, so, but that, I, that's my understanding. I, I mean, there might be some strange, I don't know, I have no idea what kangaroo's like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> never had one. But Usually when I get my collagen peptides, I get them from vital proteins and I think they're bovine, you know, probably. Yeah. It, it's a ready source, let's be honest. Um, there's a ready source of bovine. Uh, they don't tend, the po porcine can be very, porcine's very unique because a lot of the pig, believe it or not, is bioidentical to human. I, I learned that some years ago when it's another subject for another day, but if you were to take a, a natural thyroid hormone, the best ones are from pigs because they are bioidentical, mm -hmm. absolutely the same as human, which is pretty unusual. But as about half the world won't eat a pig, right? Mostly yeah. and people like that, and of course vegetarians. Um, but this really is a magic slide. I wish I could show you the amazing video they have. It's a 3D video they have, but you have to put 3D glasses on oh. <laughs> to appreciate it. But what we're seeing here, these red, this is a DNA strand, and, and these are either active or inactive parts of the DNA silenced or, or triggered and you see these red dots in the middle there that is a peptide that's actually listed above actually as a four amino acid peptide and what it's showing is it interlocks precisely with a very specific part of dna and therefore can be seen to be a key and that's what makes peptides very unique compared to your average drug your average drug, let's say you swallow a statin, um, you shouldn't, but let's say you do, um, it's going to bump and crash about and have really no guided mission at all in the hope it will meet the right reception, the receptors. These peptides are so specific, they literally will switch on or silence at one individual gene. Hmm. And the thing about this, and this is a, a, a truly remarkable part of this technology, is a gene that is on cannot be switched more on. A gene that is off, if you will, cannot be switched more off. And that helps to explain why the safety record of peptides is, of these particular peptides are unbelievably good. They've been dosed over 15 million times and they've not seen a single side effect. Let's assume for a moment that you have a weak thyroid gland and you want to improve it. You would have at least one choice. There are, there are different choices. But if you went to a GP, a, a regular medical doctor, and asked them, what can I do? They would probably put you on a synthetic thyroid or if you were lucky, they might put you on a natural porcine thyroid. They certainly do that in the United States. And you're putting the thyroid into you, right? You're not asking your thyroid gland to make any more thyroid. You're just putting it into your blood. And the dose is, is a coordinated, et cetera. But it's necessary to monitor your blood. Why? because you can overdose. If you were, and some glands, and this includes the thyroid, if you were to can you to haphazardly dose and dose and dose and dose and dose, you would downregulate the gland, which means essentially you would switch it off. And it is possible, and it has been seen, that some people who really, you know, don't pay attention and go crazy, their thyroid gland stops making thyroid. Finished. And mm. now they're stuck for the rest of their life 
on taking thyroid medication. So there's an element of risk there. Yeah. But the peptides are completely different. The peptides will either switch the gene on or silence the gene. They will never take the hormone to what we call a superlogical level. So they'll never go crazy. And believe it or not, and this is the really amazing thing about this, if you were hyperthyroid, in other words, your thyroid was making too much thyroid, guess what it does? It silences it to bring the thyroid level down. They mm -hmm. literally, and this is why they've been called peptide bioregulators, because they literally will normalize that whatever hormone it is. I mean, there's today there are 21 commercially available peptide bioregulators, mm -hmm. and we'll have a look at some of them in, in a while. So just in the case of thyroid, it will help to regulate it. So they're no good for bodybuilders. They're no good for a guy who wants to get his testosterone level up to some ridiculous level because it won't do that. They, they, I'm sorry for them. They're going to have to carry on using steroids, right? <laughs> Not really a good thing, but, you know, that's, that's their goal in life. So this is only going to normalize. But, hey, it's great for the rest of us who are aging or have some problems. That's what we want to do. We want to get our, uh, normalize our hormone levels. So it sounds like an adaptogen in plants. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But what, what we're getting down to here, Zora, is we're getting down to like brass tacks, you know, we're getting down to the mechanisms. I mean, I'm aware of adaptogens, of course, and I'm, I'm going out on a limb here when I say this, but it could be that some of those good adaptogens that are out there have these certain peptides in them, right? Yeah. I'm just, I, I, that's a guess. I'm just guessing yeah. at that. But the fact that different peptides are found in different food groups could be a key to the epigenetic nature of their action. Mm. Interesting. Kaya, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. I actually had the same questions about adaptogens. Um, so you can continue using adaptogens and peptides at the same time and also medication if you have um, a medication for thyroid can you use like um, medication plus pap peptides yes it's a short answer with one caveat and that is that if the peptide is going to start normalizing let us go back to thyroid just as, a, as an example mm -hmm. to start normalizing the thyroid one should be aware of you probably almost go to certainly have to reduce the dose of the thyroid medication that you're on. So that would be one thing to watch out for. Okay, what about adaptogens? The same thing as a medicine. Same, same thing, same thing. Same if, if you were just taking the adaptogens and the peptide, I wouldn't worry because um, the, the, the worst case scenario would be that you're wasting your money taking the peptide if or the adaptogen, whichever way you want to look at it if it's become normalized, if it's staying within a normalized level. We'll come on to the fact that you don't need to take these peptides every day. Again, if you had a thyroid problem um, and you were taking thyroid medication, there's a good chance that you take it every single day because you know the, the hormone level is only gonna stay at a certain level in the blood before it, it starts to be passed out again and you start again, et cetera. But because the peptide is essentially reinvigorating your thyroid gland to get back to work, then you don't have to worry to this, to this degree. So yes, you can combine these things, but I would suggest that you would monitor that hormone more closely to make sure that it's not going out of kilter. Is it monitoring every month or every three months or like the blood test? How often should you do the blood test then? I think it would depend on the hormone that you're evaluating. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, typically three to six months, typically, if, if there's an average, we'll say that. I mean, it, the trouble is there's so many variances here. I mean, is the patient in a very ill state? Uh, you know, uh, are they in a, a dangerous situation, you know, et cetera. But for, on average, three to six months, depending on the condition. If you're generally healthy and you are just, you know, trying to top up, shall we say, I think once a year is enough. That, personally, that's what I do. Um, but if you, the more sick you are, shall we say, then the more frequent that should become. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome.
Um, so, of course, the next thing was um, was animal experiments. So they they had discovered these things in vitro about these peptide bioregulators. I should just explain very quickly this. Peptides, what are they made from? Um, but by the way, I found out only today that peptide is yet another Greek word, so many Greek words in medicine, and um, it means digest, to digest, apparently. Um, so, but peptides are made up of amino acids. And of course, amino acids are all over the place. There are many of them. I'm aware that there are eight essential amino acids. And what does the word essential mean in this context? It means if you don't get them, you die. So it's pretty essential. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that aside, uh, and Kavinson once told me, and I've heard a similar statement elsewhere, that if we go back billions of years and we think of planet Earth, uh, you know, with its volcanoes, even pre-life, even possibly pre-plants, um, what was it like? It was like a swamp, you know, and these materials were either coming up from the land or possibly coming from meteorites in space. Yes, I accept that. And being introduced to the planet. Amino acids were floating about in this swamp. And there must have been a moment where two amino acids had come together and when that and been conjoined. And when that moment occurred and when two amino acids come together, they become a peptide. So a, a peptide can be as small as just two amino acids. And at that moment, information and instruction. So some people think that this was the genesis of life. So that's just a thought for the day, perhaps. Um, but of course, you can have much longer chains of amino acids. And what we're talking about today in these peptide bioregulators, they are two, three or four amino acids. They're small. Mm -hmm. OK, they're small. Of course, there are peptides with, with much longer chains, okay? And I did actually bother to go and look up because I wasn't aware of what the longest one was. Um, and the, um, the longest one um, is about 50, apparently. I didn't know that. But depending on the length of this chain, it, it can move from an amino acid to a peptide. There are different names of these peptides depending on how long they are, okay? I won't bore you guys with that. And then basically, then you move off to becoming a protein. And then you can even become hormones. And um, there are some incredibly long uh, amino acid hormones. The example I know is human growth hormone, which is 191 amino acids, which is why it's impossible to swallow it, because it would never be digested. It can only be injected. But, um, but that just gives you an idea. It's essentially, it's all amino acids, hormones, proteins, peptides, are all amino acids. It just depends more or less how long they are. Hmm. So Kayat have a quest, has a question. Yeah. Yes, I have another question. What is the difference between BCAAs, uh, L-glutamine and uh, peptides then? So the BCAAs and L-glutamine are forming peptides, if I understand yes. it correctly? Yes. Yes, yes that, that's right. We can start to group peptides into different categories. But really what I want to stay on today is this new, if you will, if you accept that 40 years of research is new, um, is peptide bioregulators. These are these very short two, three, four amino acid peptides. But we would have to go off in different directions to, to start explaining other groups of amino acids and different actions. Perhaps we'll do that some other time. Dr. Thierry Hertog, actually, if you go to the link that Zora's talking about, will almost certainly get into some of those peptides, even though he's principally located on hormone. Some hormones are peptides, really. I mean, uh, TRH, which is um, thyropin releasing hormone, is a tripeptide. Uh, but what is a hormone? Um, I have a terrible joke about hormones, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but <laughs> some other time. Um, but, but a hormone, again, we go back to Greek. It's another Greek word, chemical messenger. So it's an instruction within the body. But I'd like to stick today because I don't know how much time I've got left now, Zora. But um, we got 20 we, minutes. But <laughs> wow, well, I better rattle through. I better yes, rattle. It can, you know, it's it, 20 minutes. We'll have one, and it will be in an hour. But if you want to stay on and can stay on, then I will stay on. I've got time. 
Okay. What about me? Should I stay on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. Only joking. So, thing without you. <laughs> so this study is one of the early Russian studies where they, of course, started testing on animals. And as you can see, they did over 30 years, 25 experiments, giving these, this is fruit flies, this is rats, this is mice, and they all increased their lifespans and their vital life. So in other words, they all showed energy and movement and uh, sexual desire, even into older age. So it was a good sign that these peptides were not just increasing lifespan, but were increasing their capability and their activity. And as you can see from the bottom, it says that there was an average of 20 to 40% increase in the lifespan of these animals by using these peptides. Mm. So very significant. That is very significant. But they went on and they did, this is the Soviet Union, and they did some of the biggest studies I've ever heard of in my life. So this is a company in, uh, in uh, well, still in Russia, of course, Gazprom. It is the national company that uh, provides gas and I don't know, maybe oil as well. And they took, look at that, 11,192 employees. That's unheard of. It's unheard of. You know, you've got trials with things like Prozac. You're lucky if you get 600 people in it. You know, to have this number is, is, is unbelievable. And you can see they had a control group. So they took 3,000 other employees and they just gave them some multivitamins. Um, but in the main group, the guys that took the peptides, you can see they actually gave them six peptides. So they gave them, it says here, immune system, but that is actually the thymus peptide, a brain peptide, which is actually a CNS, a central nervous system, blood vessels, yes, uh, broncholi, that's obviously lung, liver, and cartilage. So these, and as you can see, it was capsules taken orally, okay? So huge number of people took these six peptides and a very large number of people took the multivitamins. Oh, by the way, I should point out that Gazprom, uh, these guys are situated in Siberia, right? This is pretty tough work. Mm. You know, this, these, these guys are working, you know, gosh, I think even living in Siberia is pretty tough work, but, but these guys are working and some of them are working outside, right? So this is a very, very harsh environment. This is not, this is not some office workers in New York. This, you know, this is pretty tough stuff. And this is what they found after just a year. So this is morbidity. So this is the incidence of disease. And OK, it's split into two. It's, it, it, you've got the control group, as you can see on the left. And you can see how many more diseases they had in that group. And then the other groups, they, they, they assess them for respiratory diseases and total morbidity. They went down, on average, they went down to a third. In other words, a 66% reduction in the instances of diseases with people taking peptides as opposed to people not taking peptides. And these weren't young people, by the way. They, when the start of the trial, they were aged between 45 and 65, okay? So don't go thinking they started giving it to 20 year olds. Mm. <clears throat> That's not the case. Can I ask you what year was that? Oh, uh, that was in the um, yeah. early 90s. Okay. I can't remember the precise year at the moment, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's okay, no, just to get an idea. And they did other tests, we'll have a quick look at them. So they then decided, uh, this one actually uh, is written down somewhere, or maybe it's the next one. Uh, well, it was, it was published in 2003, this one, so obviously it was prior to that. But this one, they then carried on with a group of guys, quite a few hundred, and this was after they retired. And they said, well, do you mind staying on the program? And, and in this particular case, they had the controls again. And then they gave one group, which is the red, epitalamin. Epitalamin is a name for the pineal peptide. And then the, the pink colored group, they gave them epitalamin, the pineal peptide, and thymolin, which is the thymus peptide, okay? And you can see, now the first group, I, I apologize for the terms, they're not my terms, okay? So they've got down elderly, people aged between 60 and 74, and senile age, aged between 75 and 89. By the way, if you ask um, a geriatric physician, um, what, does a geri what does the word geriatric mean? He or she will tell you, it only means one thing, 
It means being age 65 or older. Hmm. Does, it doesn't mean you're decrepit, that you, that you have any disease or anything. It just means being 65 or older. And rather frighteningly, they use the expression pre-geriatric for meaning anyone 45 and older. So <laughs> I, I hope that doesn't depress anybody. <laughs> Preteen. So, but, the new preteen. <laughs> <laughs> but here you can see so in the first group this is the guys age between 60 and 74 look they monitor them over 12 years and and you can see the group that got the, the pineal peptide they halved now this is mortality this is not morbidity this is mortality this is staying alive okay and literally the guys that just took the thyme, uh, sorry, big problem, the pineal, they halved their risk of dying. When they took the pineal gland and the thymus, sorry, pineal peptide and the thymus peptide, there were no, there was zero, okay? In the second group to the right, these patients aged between 75 and 89, again, almost halving of mortality with just taking the pineal and again another drop when they took the thymus as well so i think this is a clear indicator that these peptides can significantly improve lifespan mm -hmm. here's another view another trial this one published in 2011 where um, over 15 years again older individuals and they just took one. They just again, this is a trial where they only took the pineal peptide. There's, I think there's a very, I think the pineal is an extremely important gland. We could talk about that if we have time. But again, you can see right across the board, every drop on the line means there's been a death. You you can see there were 67 that were taking peptides and there were 40 in the controls. And you can see that by the end of the 15 year pe period, about 40% of the people were alive in the control group, but nearly 70% of people were alive in this one peptide group. So again, more data that seems to show that it does increase the lifespan of humans. So why? What, what, what could be the mechanism? Well, this is a study that was again done in Russia and published uh, two studies actually and here we see that in just by using the pineal peptide that in both the groups there was an increase in their telomere length okay so what so we'll come to that we're going to ask ourselves so what are telomeres sorry so one of the world's great experts on this uh, telomeres is a guy called michael fossil if you want to get into this, I do recommend his book. It's, as you can see, it's called The Telomerase Revolution. And telomeres are basically end caps to the chromosomes. I've tried to put that in the right hand corner. And they've been described as being aglets. Now, I don't know if you know what an aglet is. I didn't know what it was when I first heard the word. Um, but we all have shoelaces. And on the ends of the shoelaces, there are those little bits of plastic, aren't there? And why are they there? Well, they're there because if they weren't there, the, the, the shoelace would just fray, wouldn't it? It'd be a right mess. So that's the job they do. And they think that telom telomeres act in exactly the same way on chromosomes. They're there to keep the spiral bounded and free from damage. So there's a lot of evidence that the longer these telomeres are, the younger you would be if you were there is actually a thing now called teleage and we would start talking now about biological age measurement right we all know what our chronological ages is are i should say but individually we could have different biological ages and those biological ages may vary depending on where we measure our eyesight or our skin elasticity or the level of this or that hormone in our body that would be but they're now measuring the length of these telomeres in people and they're able to say right okay we understand you're 60 years old but good news your telomeres are equivalent to a 50 year old or bad news your telomeres are equivalent to a 70 year old so this is getting a lot of focus at the moment in the anti-aging world 
And we know from experience that the pineal peptide in particular will elongate, extend the um, telomeres. Another hot topic at the moment uh, is the Horvath epigenetic clock. Horvath, so-called because the gentleman is called Dr. Stephen Horvath from UCLA University, and he's done a lot of work here. And he's got uh, um, ways of measuring your DNA methylation. So again, it's about epigenetics, it's about methylation. And this at the moment seems to be the most accurate biological age measurement we have. It's uncannily close to what we have, okay? Sometimes when you measure biological age, depending on what you measure, you can get very wild differences. You could be 20, 30, 50 years different. You thought, well, that's ridiculous. This thing is getting very, very accurate. So accurate, in fact, that certain police forces now in the United States, if they find a blood sample, let's say there's been a horrible crime and somebody's been murdered, but they found some spots of blood from the perpetrator, they'll take that blood. And yes, of course, they'll find out what blood group it is. They'll find out whether it's male or female, but using the Horvath epigenetic clock, they can get the person's age within four to eight years. Hmm. Wow. How about that? That's so that's awesome. really a, a step forward. So knowing our Horvath clock DNA epigenetic age could be very important. So how does that relate to peptides, these peptide bioregulators? Well, the Russians weren't aware of this, you know, the Soviet Union, this is a relatively new thing. So they weren't doing any of this, but there's this gentleman and he is a lovely man. This is Dr. Bill Lawrence. He's an American doctor based in Atlanta. This is him at age 72. And I think you'll agree, he's not a bad looking gentleman at all. Which peptide is he taking? Well, he takes lots. <laughs> he takes lots. But what I wanted to tell you is he has been conducting the first non-Russian, shall we say, or certainly the first American study using the Russian peptide bioregulators. He is now, he, he's had 39 patients in his trial and they are now close to the end and the end of a three-year trial. I communicate with Bill on a regular basis. I'm not privy at the moment to tell you exactly what results are, I'm afraid. But he intends to publish by the summer of this year. And as moment he does, I can guarantee it will be a cover story on our magazine, which is called Aging Matters. But I do happen to know that all of his patients have improved both their methylation Horvath clock and their telomere length. Okay, so I can say that. <laughs> Interesting. Is can we ask uh, Magdalena? You don't have to answer, but we're asking. Um, oh yeah, if this is the the study that Magdalena is is part of, and Magdalena looks a lot younger than she is. <laughs> I, 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 I know. I know. I know Magdalena. I know her very well, and uh, she's a lovely lady. Yeah. And yes. it, make, it makes me want to live in Slovenia, but that's another. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yes, I don't think I, I'm sure she won't. Mind. She might even be online. I don't know if she's here. Yes, she's here. Oh she, gosh! She is, yes. I hope you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> yes, you. We are here. <laughs> we are <laughs> supporting you. Yeah, thank, you mate. thank you, Thank you. So, well, you know, Bill, he's a lovely guy. And yes, I, I do believe Maid is in the trial. So, okay. Um, now, this is a, just very, very, very recently. And I am so recent. In fact, I only got it this morning. This is our latest magazine. Okay. Uh, and as you can see, it's entitled Brawn, or maybe you can't see, Getting Leaner and Stronger. Um, but the article, the first article in here was an interview I did with Professor Cavinson. Um, in the early part of last year in St. Petersburg. And I asked him, have these peptides been used in sports and anywhere else, okay? And he told me all about how the Russians use them in their Olympic team, okay? Mm -hmm. And he went on to tell me something else which we'll come to in the next slide, which I wasn't expecting. Now, this picture here with the names of the people involved and Professor Cavinson is standing in the middle, 
And then these other ladies are the various coaches of the Russian team. The other girls that are here, all these girls are like 20, 21, 22, they're young girls. And they were the gold winners of the gymnastics at the London Olympics, okay? And they were all on these peptides. And the shocking thing is, right, if you, these, these kind of athletes, they do extreme exercise, okay? And I've got, I've probably got a story about everything, but, but I've got a story about that as well, but I'll do it another time. But if you're going to push your body to, imagine these girls, they're doing probably eight, 10 hours every day of extreme exercise, 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 exercise. What was shocking is these 20 something year old, young 20 year old girls and goal winners, you know, top of their game, when they measured their telomere length, they were all equivalent to a 40 year old. Oh, wow. Right? What they did is they got them on the peptide regime and they all normalized within two to three weeks. So, two to three weeks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So, wait, they didn't, so they were on peptides when they were winning their gold medals and peptides when they got off. Yeah. Or, so yep. why weren't the peptides kicking in during the training? This was prior to them going into the Olympics. So they got the girls in and they evaluated them. Ah. And they found out this shocking horror about the telomeres. They put them on the peptide program. So okay. were the peptides there to enhance their performance too or just to get them back to normal? Uh, the first one is very difficult for me to answer. But, you, you know, when you take a human like these girls who... At peak physical, it, it's almost hard to make an edge. But I think, you know, if, if you had someone of more average capacity, it would make quite a reasonable difference. But these were at the very top of their game. But what it did do for these girls very dramatically was the recovery times were absolutely obliterated. Because normally, these, you know, if these girls had gone and done the London and won the gold, they'd have been resting up for like three months, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a, you know, it's a hell of a thing. But they didn't. They were, they were back on form in like three weeks hmm. be, because of the peptides. They think because of the peptides. And it was certainly borne out with the blood work that they did on these girls, which included, of course, this telomere lengthening. Hmm. You know, it's hard to take someone who's 20 years old at the peak of their condition and make them better. I mean, how young can we be? You know, <laughs> are we going to turn them into five-year-olds? <laughs> I don't think so. But what we want, of course, is as we get older, the more significant the reversal can be. So if we're 50 years old, we can be like 30. You know, if we're 80 years old, we can be like 50, right? That's, that's really the, the crux of it. So which peptide is that one for the 50 year olds? That's the one I want. Well, we, I, at the end, I, <laughs> quite. Um, at the end, I can talk a little bit about specific programs. I'd be happy to do Yeah, that. yeah, no, we it's, gotta get into that. Like, what are the differences in peptides sure. and which to take for what and how to inject them or take them as a capsule? All that yeah. There's some really good news. Uh, I'll be finished very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing that Professor Kavinson started talking to me about is how the, their cosmonauts use the peptides, right? And I didn't, I wasn't expecting that at all. And, um, and of course, if you think about what a cosmonaut has to do, they're in a very extreme environment, you know, it's very, they, and these guys, they go up on the, the, the space labs and they stay up there for like a year on end. So in the past, when these guys used to come home, they were a mess for months, you know, trying to adjust to the earth's gravity and all this business. It was great. But now with, Yes, they do other things as well. I grant you they exercise now when they're up in space and one or two other things. But the peptides have been a very important part of protecting these guys in space and getting them to recover quickly when they come back from long journeys. So I think that's quite interesting. Here on the other side are some covers. These are our last six magazines. Um, you guys are very welcome. I'll show you the website at the end. You can go there. You can download these magazines free of charge, okay? And as you might imagine, we've covered this peptide story in different ways. They're not all peptide stories. We talk about a lot of different things. But I think this peptide story is one of the best I've ever come across. Yeah. So and, sorry, Zora. No, it's, uh, no, it's very interesting. That the, the magazines, I recommend everybody to go and, and check it out because there's just chock-a-block full of information. And um, Kaya has a question about burnout. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm, I'm guessing peptides will help people who have burnout, I guess, in terms of stress. If you can Absolutely. kind of, you can explain yourself if that's- I it. think that- That's usually uh, the, because usually it's very, very long time to recover from a burnout. I had it when I was 26 and it's like, they told me that I will, that I will never be the same, which I don't believe it's not true. I help myself a lot. I'm just saying, I also- Oops. Just one more Sorry, thank you. lost you at the end there um yes i have a lot of clients with burnout also so it's like or with burnout issues so i'm just wondering if like if if peptides can magically help with with burnout too probably then i assume that when you say burnout you're probably referring to adrenal fatigue yes yes oh definitely in fact it's one of the best sellers in the range so it obviously works. And uh, as you know, the adrenals produce a lot of hormones and, um, you know, and all including cortisol. And actually a lot of burnout can be a lack of cortisol. Um, some people don't like that because, of course, some people think cortisol is the dark hormone that causes lots of damage. But it's like everything in life. We need a balance, right? Mm. Too little or too much of anything is the wrong thing to do. So but yes, definitely, definitely the adrenal. I'll talk a little bit if we have time at the end about how you can create a synergistic program as well. Cool. Um, these are two books that we've produced, we've helped to produce. The one on the left, the Peptide Bioregulator Revolution. I got the idea there from some of those rather groovy old revolution Russian posters. Um, that's a public book, but it will give you, if you really want to get into an introduction about this, that will give you all the background. And the one on the right was um, is a scientific book. So if you really want the detail, if you really want to drill down into the various aspects that, the, and as you can see, it's called Peptides in the Epigenetic Control of Aging. That was written by Professor Kavinson, Professor Marineoff, and a guy called Phil Mikens. I don't know who he is. Um, and we also have a, um, uh, a, a dedicated bookstore for specialist books, they're, they're not a run of the mill store, and that's the longevity dot store. But of course you can find them on Amazon. They're always on Amazon, aren't they? <laughs> um, so today you can still buy the Russian uh, peptide bioregulators. Uh, most of the packaging is in Russian. So unless you know that language, I'm not saying there isn't English on it, there's some English on it, um, but it's a bit difficult. and they all have different names and it's rather difficult to get your head around the names. I can go off into that. But what we've done is we produce them in English packaging and we call the brand Nature's Marvels. And then we just keep it simple. So the one on the top left, the pineal bioregulator, the one in the middle, the blood cell bioregulator, the one on the right, the thymus bioregulator and so on. And as you can see from the bottom today, uh, by the way, these are food supplements. These are not drugs um, in the classic sense of the word. There are 21 of these available at present. Okay. So what, how would you go about choosing it? Like, and do you need a doctor to guide you with this or like, how do you? Um, it depends uh, on what you want to do. The fact is that they're so safe that if you bought one and it wasn't the right one for you, the worst thing you're probably going to do is waste your money. So, um, of course, we always recommend working with a health professional. I don't necessarily advocate a, a medical doctor. One of the problems with a lot of medical doctors is, and I hope I'm not going to upset anybody who's a medical doctor on here now, but um, they can be quite limited in what their knowledge is. They're not a nutritionist who's studied nutrition or they're not, you know. So when I say, or a naturopath doctor, different kind of doctor, right? So I always, when I say it, I often say, you know, use a health professional to guide you and to, to help you. But I don't honestly believe that this technology needs a medical doctor. I, I, I view health as a pyramid. And the base of the pyramid, of course, is the basics we all should know, like doing exercise, eating good food and drinking good water and, and having clean air. But as we move up the pyramid, and we would do it less often because it's a pyramid, right? So there's less of the material. 
But the next one I would call the additional level. So we might take some vitamins and minerals and, you know, that sort of thing, which any, which everyone I think would, would agree is a very so, so safe. I would actually place the peptide bioregulator orals into that section. Mm. The next one up, which could have things like hormones in them, okay, I call it the advanced level. Now I'm definitely going to recommend that you have a health professional working with you, okay? And finally, the very tip of the pyramid, you've really got the experimental section where you've got things like perhaps stem cells or other, other emerging technologies, shall we say. So again, you're definitely going to want to work with a doctor on those. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, peptides are pretty safe then. Um, these particular ones. Let me, let me just say it's peptide bioregulators. There are many peptides out there. Some of them are injectables and that puts you in a different category again. So, but these peptide bioregulators, because there's so much research, there's so many decades behind them, I think the safety profile is excellent. So we have one question here. Uh, what are the primary differences between these peptides and the ones popular in the US right now that are mostly injectables? Yeah. Well, firstly, it will be the length of their amino acids. Um, some of the injectables, I'm familiar with some of them, of course, being used in the United States, um, have much longer chains. They have to be injected. Not everyone's going to be keen on having to inject, I would say. An injection by nature should be something you do under the purview of a health professional, I would suggest. Um, and some of those are very targeted. Um, I don't know, I'll give you one example, PK141. I mean, it, and the other thing I should point out is many of them have not been made commercially available. They're either being compounded by specialist pharmacies or unfortunately they're being offered by what I call the kitchen chemist, mm -hmm. which is an online store, which you go and see all these vials of things all for sale telling you how to inject it and then having a disclaimer at the bottom saying they're all for research and not for human use. Mm. So there's no liability insurance with that. So PK141 is a peptide that if a man injects into his penis, he will have an erection. Okay. Mm. So that's a very targeted, very specific. And there are others. I mean, thymosin alpha one, which Terry Hertog certainly recommends, is very active in helping the um, thymus gland and is a big booster of the immune system. But the thing about the peptide bioregulators, and yes, they do come in injections, okay, they do come as injections, but the, the capsules that we're looking at here, they can be taken by mouth, they're easy, they're not that expensive, and you don't need a prescription. So. Does that answer it? <laughs> well, and, and so the question also is, uh, so the, it, are they injecting it because the peptides themselves are larger and you can't just ingest them orally? In some cases, yes. And in other cases, like um, thymosin alpha-1, some, some of the peptides are very unstable, partly because of the length of their chain. And some of them, they require to be kept cold. Okay, so you must keep it in a fridge. Mm -hmm. They're not overly unstable you know possibly if you let them at room temperature for some days they'd be fine but if you left them say for weeks at room temperature then they'd be destroyed mm -hmm. so you don't get that with these either they're much more they are stable at room temperature so so, so if somebody wants to get into peptides for a certain i don't know objective would it is there is it more is it work better to have an injectable than an oral oh I think I couldn't possibly deny that. I think there's possibly nothing on the planet that doesn't work better when it's injected than if it's taken orally, simply because you're delivering it straight into the bloodstream mm. and you're bypassing any stomach degradation, or even if you've got an enteric coated capsule, which would you know, dissolve in, in the lower gut. Um, generally speaking in pharmacology, um, an intravenous injection is number one in terms of the amount of active ingredient it will deliver into blood. Uh, an intramuscular, sometimes a subcutaneous injection are level two. Level three is a nasal spray. That's why uh, you don't, you level, that's a very active way. Uh, level four does depend on the molecule, but 
but level four tends to be transdermal, i.e. you put it onto the skin. Mm -hmm. And quite a long way down from that is capsules and tablets. Mm -hmm. So the ones that you have on the website there, is they're only oral or do you That's have- correct. Oral? We are We are about to introduce some sublinguals, which I, I, forget, I forgot to mention sublingual, but obviously sublingual puts it somewhere between uh, somewhere around the transdermal because you know it goes in under the tongue as you know and that's a, that's quite a nice there's a lot of blood vessels under the tongue and that's a quite a quick route to the bloodstream so that's the reason for that and but, do the peptides the oral ones the nature's marvels do you, they have to be refrigerated no just room te regular room temperature you know it's, you know you don't want them too hot or too, but that's true of everything right if you had a i don't know um a packet of vitamin c um, and you live in Death Valley, um, which is, I believe, is the hottest place on the planet, um, you know, you probably have to keep it in your fridge. But room temperature is generally considered to be around 65 Fahrenheit. So that's that's a sort of OK, fine. Uh, so then um, the question I have also before we get, get move on is and ask Kaya's question too. Um, the ones that, say, Magdalena are taking, and I understood they were they were tailor-made. So what's the difference between tailor-made and um, sort of a, a, a generic? Well, I'm not privy to what Magdalena is actually taking, but I think this expression is referring to the fact that Dr. Lawrence would have recommended after her test or evaluation, because what you're addressing is your weak points. You know, if you haven't got a thyroid problem, if your thyroid's regular, why would you take the thyroid peptide okay but if as the other lady said you, you're suffering from burnout you're definitely going to want to look at the adrenal peptide mm -hmm. so it isn't about that there are three peptides in fact i take the top three every month right What's that? That so that's pineal blood vessel thymus of course the thymus right now is a real key one to take because people's concerns about covid so you, you know that's a key way to boost your immunity uh, blood vessel, why? Because if you improve blood flow in the body, you can generally improve everything. You know, it's all about delivering nutrition to the cells and removing waste from the cells. Um, and the pineal, which we can get into because that's a, wow, that's a subject all in itself. Um, but we know one thing about the pineal uh, um, uh, peptide. It will certainly improve my melatonin levels and it will also uh, from the studies at least and I haven't had my follow-up test yet I should have had my I had a telomere test about 15 months ago and I should have had one by now but this ah. blinking COVID thing I've ended up <laughs> getting another one uh, can't even get out the house never mind get a blood test done um, no it's not quite that bad but you know what I mean um, and so that so those are the three so I take those personally I take two capsules a day I take one pack for 10 days that's all you need to do and then I switch and I take another one, two capsules a day, 20 for 10 days, and then I switch. So basically 30 days in the average month, I know every day I'm taking a peptide and I just rotate. Them. So if you decide and you find out, because in, Ma in Magdalena's case, I call her Maida, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't I Maida? Um, and... Um, and it's in her case, I'm sure Dr. Lawrence would have done her bloods, et cetera, and would have said, right, this one, this one, this one, this one. So that's the tailor-made part of it. Ah, I see. Okay, I thought he was compounding it. So I was like, it sounds like a bioidentical hormone or something. So does, um, I just want to ask Philip if he, if he answered your question, because he was asking about how often you take these peptides and what dosage. Does it, does it change for each one at the depending in, on what you take. in a word no in a word no what what it is is you have to decide how serious is the problem you're addressing okay if you've got uh let's get back to thyroid because nice easy one um if you're hypothyroid so your thyroid and most people are they they reckon that as much as 50 percent of the adult population has a weak thyroid okay so we could go into the reasons why but just take it as read that that's been published on a few a few occasions so you want to improve your thyroid condition you're going to take the thyroid peptide now the general recommendation is start with an intensive course 
And an intensive course is two capsules every day for 30 days. So that's three boxes, okay, 60 capsules. That's how you start, okay? If you want to then go on to like a high maintenance dose, I would recommend one box per month. So 20 capsules, 10 days of the month, two capsules per day, okay? And you just do that every month. As the condition improves, you come down. And you can come down to as little as one box every three months. And in some cases, every six months. So this is the point about the peptides being gene switches. Once they've switched a gene on or off, as the case may be, they don't need to be repeated that often, which a hormone does. As I say, a hormone could almost be every day because it's in the blood, it's out of the blood, etc. So you, so I say, start with an intensive course, start with three, three packs in a month, reduce it to one pack a month if you still have a problem. But if you just want to now maintain, you say, well, the problem's gone, but I want to make every three months. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the peptides in terms of money a much cheaper option because compared to hormones, you, which you're going to need every day or nearly every day, these perhaps are only needed every other month. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I, I want to stress as well, like you explained the pyramid too, is taking these is, is already, it's, it's a supplement to an already healthy diet and lifestyle. I think, we, you know, there's no miracles. It, the more that you take care of your health to have the base of that pyramid set, I think the better, the more efficacy you'll have with, with any kind of supplement for that Absolutely. matter. And I'm guessing peptides is also in that category. I, I absolutely right, Zora. You know, this is not an excuse to eat McDonald's, um, uh, drink strong beer, and never move out of your chair. You know, that's not what anything's about. It, it, as you rightly say, it's a pyramid. You should all be doing the good things. But if you want to put an edge on it, then these things help. Or you can speed up. I mean, one of the things, of course, is like... Um, at the beginning of the year, lots of people make uh, New Year's resolutions. And the common one, of course, is I'm going to get fit. I'm going to go and exercise. I'm going to I'm going to join a gym. And the trouble is most people give up about six weeks in mm -hmm. because they, they see an initial improvement. And then the improvement becomes so slow. They think, oh, I can't, I'm not going to this bloody gym again today. And they just give it up. Right. So if you can introduce agents such as these that will help improve that process, help speed up the process, help get better results quicker, then people stay on the program. That, that's, I think, a, a yeah. maybe more psychological, but I think that's a, a, a part of it. Um, before I, I get, I know I'm going to get to Kaya's question, but I want to get Amy's because I know she's in Hong Kong and <laughs> wants to go to right. bed. Um, she wants to ask uh, Phil if about some of the clinical effects that you've had from these peptides. Mm -hmm. Right. OK, fine. Now, I, it was difficult for me to, to know what slides to put in and what slides not to put in. Uh, you know, I didn't I couldn't judge the audience. And also, you know, we have one hour. So, you know, did, did you want to do a whole day on it? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> probably not. Um, but one of the most um, profound clinical, there's a clinic in St. Petersburg. It's run by a lovely lady by the name of Professor Svetlana Trofimova. And she, her clinic is called the Tree of Life. Quite a nice name. But what she specializes in is in eye treatment. OK, and and I think Zora and I have got an idea at some future date that we might do a thing about eyesight. Yeah. Um, different aspects of eyesight. But Svetlana um, in her clinic, she has got these topological photographs of the back of the eye computer generated visions. I was going to show a slide, but I didn't put it in. I'm sorry. Um, and what they do, they get there's one lady that they had was in a bad way. Her eyesight in this particular eye was 90 percent gone. Ninety nine oh percent of her eyesight was gone. And so here's the here's the round back of her eye on the and most of it's black. Some of it's red. That means very little eyesight. Some of it is yellow, which means some eyesight, and very, very little of it was green, meaning she had this part of her retina had the right eyesight. What they did, what they do with these patients, of course, this is an extreme condition we're talking about now. This is not a mild condition. This is an extreme condition. 
what they did with that particular lady, um, what they do with most of the people, they inject the retina peptide. Okay, there's a retina peptide and they inject it into the orbit of the eye. This is the area around, not into the eye, not into the eye, but around the orbit of the eye, just subcutaneously into the skin. And they do that for 10 days. And after they've done that, they send the patient home with the, um, pep, in this case, the retina peptide. They almost certainly would have also given her the blood vessel peptide because the blood vessel peptide is synergistic with all of them. And it, as I said earlier, it's not really a, a, a rocket science to, you know, if you improve blood flow, you're going to improve all sorts of things. So what they would have done with her, they would have sent her home and they would have kept her on the intensive course. So she was taking two capsules every day. OK, after a year, she came back into the clinic. They did the same test again. And they moved her from 90% blindness in that eye to 30% blindness in that eye. Okay. Wow. Now, in normal circumstances, there are other examples where they've got people coming in who have a problem, but there may be 10, 15, 20% blind in an eye, that there are sections of the eye where they can't see anything. They normalize them. They normalize them. So if that's not a profound clinical. <laughs> that is pretty oh. amazing. I don't know if it's a extreme case, uh, maybe not with everybody, but it does give hope that if it can help somebody like that, well, then hopefully the, you know, just the milder cases, it should be quite effective. Um, I'm going to get to Kaya's question now and all the other ones, but I, it's like so late. So we're going so over and I know some people want to go, but before they go, I really want to let you know that you can find more information at um, the IAS, the antiagingsystems.com website. Um, you can see there you see on the slide, it's www.antiaging-systems.com. And you can also check out the magazine, Aging Matters. It's uh, www.aging, without the E, dash matters.com. And then there's a YouTube channel. I haven't seen that one yet. I got to check that out called Anti-Aging Systems. And there's, this is a great, great resources to learn more about peptides and, and just about anything biohacking. You know, you're already the next level biohacking. <laughs> Everything you can find on this website is on all these, all these websites are, are the next level. If you um, want a discount, Phil organized it for us. You can use Zora Dash. 1515 and you'll get 15% off your first order. And I think there's two different um, uh, stores and everything. So you can actually use it twice. So keep that in mind. Um, and these are these are wonderful things to, to take advantage of. And I certainly am gonna go straight to that store and get mine as well. Um, I want to get to um, uh, Ikaya's question. And um, and if anybody else has questions, please put them in the chat. And if I haven't, if I missed it, please let me know again. Um, she says, what would you recommend for problems with insomnia, burnout, weight loss issues, and lack of period, amenorrhea? Okay. Um, weight loss issues, I presume to lose weight, not to gain weight, because some people do. You know, the muscle mass is gaining weight, obviously. Um, the, uh, the burnout is easy. That's definitely the adrenal uh, peptide. That's straightforward. Uh, I, it, Vladimir Kavinson always recommends if you want to boost everything, take the blood vessel peptide with it. Okay, you'll get faster results, maybe maybe slightly improved, but there'll be faster results anyway. Um, weight loss is a bit more tricky with these. There is a muscle peptide which does have some degree of building muscle and burning fat. The problem with that, of course, isn't necessarily weight loss because you, you go and weigh yourself and you oh God, I'm heavier, but you, I, you put more muscle on, right? So <laughs> I meant more like, um, excuse me, I meant more for my clients are having problems with like overeating. I mean, they are, they are like, they are hungry all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, you, I would suggest that is um, a sugar control issue that, you know, sugar spikes and they feel hungry and they go back and get another candy bar. Um, I would have to say the pancreas uh, enzyme, uh, peptide, beg your pardon, pancre pancreatic peptide 
because it's going to help stabilize insulin levels. It's going to keep some of those sugar levels more stable. That would that would certainly be. Unfortunately, they haven't produced a um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm going to, pituitary and they forgot it. A pituitary peptide yet because um, pituitary. If there was, I would hope that that would drive up growth hormone levels, and and that's a great way to burn fat because by driving up growth hormone levels, you also drive up IGF one levels. Uh, but they don't do that at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, and sorry, there was a third one. What was the other one? Uh, yes, I, it was insomnia, insomnia. Insomnia. Okay, I think the answer to that one is the pineal because we get back to melatonin and melatonin and the pineal is one of my favorite subjects in the whole wide world. Yeah, so it shows you what kind of life I lead. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, seriously, um, getting a good night's rest uh, getting uh, melatonin is definitely helpful. I'm no doubt you've told them to be in a blacked out room and all that kind of thing, um, which is very important. But the reason for that to be in a blacked out room is that light entering the eye destroys melatonin and a lack of melatonin is not going to put your body on the right circadian rhythm. And so because that's how your body knows when it's day and night, you know, it produces melatonin in response to darkness which is why nearly everyone who's on shift work or is traveling around the world on aircraft is in a mess because their body doesn't know what time of day it is. And that leads us also into the uh, rotational theory of aging, where there could actually be a programmed death clock, which they assume is in the pineal gland because the pineal gland can count day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night. And maybe when you've had 120 years worth of that, it says end, finish. But that's another story. But um, yeah, the pineal, the pineal, which is, a, in my opinion, if you if you're generally healthy, but you want to take that step, you've got to take the pineal. This this the fact that it extends telomeres, the fact that it's improving the methylation clock, the fact that it increases improves our melatonin production. You know, I, I for me, if you said to me, Phil, you can only have one, that would be the one. Uh Thank you. What about amenorrhea? The Sorry, lack, amenorrhea, the lack of period. Oh, yes, of course. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, again, um, uh, in terms of peptides, there are other things I could talk about, of course, but in terms of peptides, I would go for the ovary peptide because it will help to regulate estrogen and progesterone. So many peptides. One question about, uh, okay. is, you have these peptides and I'm trusting that you've done the research and you trust the source and all that. Um, do we have to be worried about different brands and uh, are there, is it the wild, wild west out there just like with supplements that we may not be sure what we're getting into if, if we just buy anything offline, mm -hmm. online? There is, of course, because this is an emerging technology, new kinds of technology, there is always an element of the Wild West. I would like to say to you that after 30 years in the business, and we are recommended by world-renowned doctors whose names and addresses are posted on our website, you know, we haven't made them up. You know, people like Thierry Hertog, for, as an example, um, that we do the right thing. And of course, it's in our interest to do all our due diligence. These peptides actually come direct from the Institute in St. Petersburg. I, in my working career, I've always tried very hard to get the original product from source. Why? Because the devil is in the detail. You know, just because you've got the pineal, we think you have the pineal peptide. Is it really the pineal peptide? You know, what faith have you got? And if you're using the one that was used in the trial, the chances are you're going to get the same results. So, and even though that might be a little bit more expensive, isn't that what we want? Isn't, isn't at the end of the day, we have a problem and we want a solution, don't we? That, that's it really, isn't it? So yes, I would say, I did mention them earlier. I used the expression kitchen chemist. There are people out there who are buying raw materials, mainly from China, bringing them into their country, wherever that is, um, and who knows how 
mixing this bag into a vial. Uh, I always imagine they're doing it in their kitchen, right? And then they put a label on it and they'll say such and such in this. And then they have a website where they put all these things up and they'll say, you know, and then on the website, it will say not for human use, R&D research only. Yeah. Okay. But none of those will be um, commercially available. And who knows how they've mixed it, right? When, you, when you're trying to get, say, 100 micrograms of something into you, who knows if they're not using a kitchen scale and a teaspoon? Yeah. You know, you, you, so definitely stay away from those guys. Use reputable companies. Use reputable pharmacies, mm. I would suggest. Is it, are, are they expensive peptides? It varies. It varies. Um, some of the really new ones, if we talk about peptide bioregulators, you're looking at between 30 and $50, that's American dollars, per box. OK, uh, the most expensive one, unfortunately, is the pineal one, and that is $70. But consider that you may only use three or four a year. Yeah. Now, I don't want to mention any names, but there is a very famous supplement on the market with two letters and two numbers. I think that's enough of a clue. <laughs> um, and it, it, it has two clinicals behind it, which is good, you know, for extending telomeres i'm not knocking the product at all but it runs at 600 dollars a month oh. and you're going to have to keep taking it and there's another one out there with three letters and three numbers <laughs> and it's almost even more expensive yeah. so if you start thinking that you can use the peptide at a cost of 70 dollars every three months at the at the moment it's the best value Actually, I think that sounds very reasonable. It sounds like a high quality vitamin, um, more yeah. or less. So we have, Elena has a question. You can unmute yourself. Hello, Elena. Yes. Lovely today. <laughs> we know each other. <laughs> yeah, hi, Phil. Hi again. So very nice presentations. And I would like to ask you, I know that in Russia, scientists have proposed uh, using peptides to fight the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have your personal experience and the very effective one, the effective recovery. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend and uh, what is your um, ideas about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, from the peptide point of view, um, I would say you definitely want to take the thymus peptide. Okay, and I would also combine that again with the, in this current climate with the blood vessel peptide. So that would be the the peptide approach, I would suggest. Um, of course, it does depend what you're doing. Are you concerned about COVID, but you don't have it? Or do you have COVID? Of course, these are two different things. Um, beyond that, uh, my wife got COVID um, uh, and she happened to be in Turkey, in Istanbul at the time, and she was admitted to the hospital. It's a bit of a long story, but I'll cut right to the chase. Um, and I love the Turks because I've never seen a more open medical system where you can actually talk to the doctors and they will actually take your advice on board. So, yeah, we'll try it. And they're very keen and happy to use what they call complementary medical therapies in, a, in as well as drugs. I mean, there's a lot of countries and hospitals out there. They won't even entertain a vitamin, for example. Anyway, what did they do for my wife? They put her on 20. No, they put her on 30 grams of intravenous vitamin C every day, right? They gave her mushroom extracts. They gave her, they, she drank colloidal silver every day. And a little later on, she was given a name I can't remember at the moment, but she was given some of the uh, Japanese antiviral drug. In two weeks, she was out. It's a true biohacker cocktail. Okay. <laughs> and I would also look at... Um, ivermectin it's very cheap yes. been around forever it works okay we can treat covid i think a lot of the reason these people are dying in the western hospitals okay is because they're not being properly treated okay if you go i know this is going to sound weird if you go to the western sahara they hand out ivermectin do you know how many covid deaths they've had so so far zero wow right and that's not the only country in the world where they've got extremely low levels of COVID. Actually, deaths. in Argentina, 
evidently ivermectin is sold in the vet, with veterinarians. There are huh? vet people are hoarding them going to the vet, yeah. and using it for animals, and and evidently they're yeah it's helping. And uh, I don't know the rates of COVID deaths in Argentina. I know it's um, you know like everywhere else they've been suffering, but it'd be interesting to know how many people are actually taking ivermectin and um, and recovering from it. Yes, yes, definitely. I think there's there's, there's plenty of choices out there. Um, it, and at the end of the day it's all about keeping a healthy immune system. And as we know, 90 odd percent of people who, who um, get COVID don't even know they got COVID mm -hmm. because their immune system is so good, it doesn't trouble them, you know? So it, it is only a very small number of people. In my view, it's complete overkill of what we're doing to people. It, there, are, there are some vulnerable in the society and they need protecting. But for the majority of us, we can be sensible, you know? We don't, we don't need to be locked inside our houses. I think it, it's quite crazy, but there we are. But, yeah. but they don't want you to, oh, I'm gonna get a bit conspiratorial theory here, but they don't really want you to learn that there are effective cheap treatments that have been around for many years and proven to be safe when you can go along and have one of these experimental vaccines. Yeah. So, you know, um, but, but sorry, Elaine, to get back to your question, use the thymus, peptide, use the uh, blood vessel peptide, always take vitamin C, always take vitamin D, take some zinc. And in our household, we use silver gel and silver colloidal mouth sprays. We don't use the alcohol ones because colloidal silver, I don't know about COVID, but nobody's found the COVID virus yet. Just remember that because all the labs around the world are looking for it. A virus typically has 30 to 40,000 base pairs, okay? All they can ascertain from this COVID is around 50 to 60 base pairs, okay? So that's a bit worrying, but colloidal silver in the past has killed every virus it's been, including anthrax wow. that it comes into contact with. So colloidal silver, nice. I think the, the point is to keep your immune system strong, no matter how you do it. This is what drives me crazy about government regulations and talking about the masks and social distancing, washing your hands. Yes, that's great. Okay. But no one talks about let's, let's boost our immune system. And, and, it, and it's not about buying organic or something. It's yeah. about getting proper sleep. It's about yeah. managing your stress. Uh, you know, of course, eating a healthy diet, moving a bit, but, it's oh, your best defense. I can't control what's happening in the world, but I can control my immune system. So these peptides that you're recommending, that would go on top of what I, of the base of the pyramid. This is what we're talking about. Always is fundamental. That foundation, if it's strong, wouldn't have to worry. Um, if you're generally, you know, healthy and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things I, I can't stress enough is, is you can't you know, afford to not have a strong immune system. Oh, right now. And number, for the one, number one, number <laughs> one. Somebody said something. Yes. I, you know, hydroxylquinone, you know, the drug that Trump spoke about and all that stuff. Yeah. I haven't really gone into any deep research on it, but my understanding of its methodology of action is that it opens up the iron channels on the virus that's what it does but it's zinc that it allows to pass through to kill the virus okay and that's why when they tried to use trials where they just gave the hydroxylquinone and no additional zinc they were relying only on the innate levels of zinc in that patient's body which if they were low wasn't going to do very much every study i've seen and heard about and other docs have told me about is that when you combine these two agents, it's far more effective. Hmm. And the study that they like to roll out to say, oh, it's really dangerous and it caused these heart problems, it was in the Lancet, got retracted because it was fraudulent. Hmm. But how many people know that? Because all they heard was all the publicity it got when it got published, right? But it had to get retracted some months later because this the Nazi said, wow, this is just complete BS. And they pulled it. But not many people know that. 
It's crazy, um, absolutely crazy. But that's the thing is, again, how much do we control this? And if you feel like you can, go for it. In the meantime, take care of your health, boost your immune system. It's not a guarantee. Okay, <laughs> so one day or something or another, that's but at least you get a better shot. If you want me to tell a joke, and it is a joke, I just, I just uh, let Mr. Gates know that if he's got any of his lawyers listening, this is a joke, Bill, joke. But um, Bill Gates has said that there will be a new COVID strain. It's going to be called COVID-21. And it will appear on November the 15th, about 10.30 in the morning. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> would, I, would anyone like to watch a two-minute BBC video? Yes, yes. About, and I, this is pretty mind-blowing. I'll, I'll, I'll let you watch it. And then if you want to talk about it afterwards, I'm very happy to do so. This is, yeah, this is a good moment. Um, any last questions? If people have to go, um, you can ask last minute questions or you can just leave. That's no problem. I'm going to be following up with an email. We are going on to two hours now. Um, so I, I totally understand if you have things to do. We have Kaya who says, can we become your student? I am so super excited about everything you said. So I, 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 I'm so excited. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right, very, kind of you. very kind of you. Thank I'm enjoying you. myself. I didn't know it was two hours. I'm enjoying myself, you see. It's been an hour and 42. <laughs> so um, if you guys want to hang around, more than welcome to. Um, so, you know, keep just just stay on. We'll probably watch the video, have a little discussion, and then we'll, we'll all have to go. Okay? This, this is the most mind-blowing video you'll see this year. Oh, yes. Okay, so at least stay for that. Right. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Okay, we'll give it a go then. Made by the BBC in 2008. Just a short thing. Let's get that. No, oh, wait, we can't see the screen. You got you still have your slide show up. Phil? Oh, looks like he's frozen. Phil? I think you're frozen. Let me see if I can type. Phil, can you hear me? We, we can't see the video. And we Sorry, Zora. We can't see the video. Oh, oh gosh. Oh dear. Right. Let me. Stop. Um, yeah, just stop the. I'll, I'll make it full screen. Sorry. Yeah, but you have to also change the slideshow because the slideshow is on the the sh screen sharing is on the slideshow. So change. Oh, the, of change course, the... of course, of course, of course. I do beg your pardon. Yes, I put you on the wrong one, didn't I? Yeah, we've just got one. Can you see it now? Uh, yeah. Good. Shall I start it again? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, here we go. Is there sound? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, there's no sound. Do you, do you, does anyone hear the sound? I don't hear sound. Oh, I'm sorry, I must be, okay, it's, um, it's playing through my speaker and I thought it would be picked up with my microphone. No. Shall I describe it then? Shall I, let me, um, let me just shrink a few boxes down around here. Oops. How do I get rid of that box there? Oh, you, is there a, a, a link and you can open it on YouTube or something? I couldn't find it. I, I downloaded this some years ago okay. and it seems to have disappeared off, um, off, uh, how do I get the sound? Oh, I know how to do that. I'm becoming a real Luddite. Let's have a go. Oh, there you go. Maybe maybe it's increasing the volume. Oh, wait, now I can't hear you at all. You've you've muted yourself. You unmute yourself, Phil. You've unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be a bit tricky. I'll tell you what, if I turn the volume down, that's what I'll do. And then I'll play it because I, I can hear it very clearly my end. But um, Let's see. so what it is, is this is a BBC reporter. Let's see if it works. And he walks in to this guy's shop. 
guy called Lee Spivak. Here, he, there's Lee, as you can see, is not a young man, and he runs this model shop. And he's explaining to him that he started the engine of that plane, and it cut his finger off. And um, he then shows, and he says, "How much of the finger did it cut off?" And he says, "Oh, it took about that much off." And then you'll see the photographs from the hospital and they lost the finger. They never found the finger. So there's his finger. Oh, but wow. what you're seeing now is it regrowing. Okay? No. And that is four weeks later. You, Perfect. When the no, nerves, the tissue, the ne that. everything grew back. What really? did they use? They used a peptide. They used a peptide that they, they've given a stupid name. They've called it pixie dust. And... This is the University of Pittsburgh preparing the pixie dust. They're extracting it from the lining of a pig's bladder. It's not exactly rocket science, is it? Uh -huh. And then they dry it and they have it prepared like this. And because they're gene switches, in this particular case, and Lord knows why there's this extracellular matrix doing in pig's bladders, but it instructed his body to regrow his finger. And this is the professor at the University of Pittsburgh, who in this 2008 video is saying, listen, I don't think in 10 years time, we'll be able to regrow a limb, but we will be able to regrow tendons and muscles and all sorts of things. And it will be a huge leap forward. Wow. And then finally, they go and look at what the US military are doing with the poor guys who've been injured in various wars. But I don't, don't think you need to see that bit. Um, so that's pretty amazing, isn't it? But how I, did they, was he in taking them orally? Did they put it on top nope. of his finger? They, they put it onto the wound. They just placed it onto the wound. Now that was 2008. I go to conferences around the world and I sometimes show that video and I'm still amazed at how few people, when I say, have you ever seen this? Have you ever heard of this? How few people put their hands up, you know? It's it's quite amazing, but you would think it, it would make headlines. Like you you would, world. you would. Well, this guy here, right? This was um, 2011. This guy, as you can see, his name is Corporal Hernandez, and he dropped a mortar bomb on himself as he was moving them around in Afghanistan, and you can see his leg there. He blew away 70% of his muscle in his right thigh. Okay, and they. They said, you're going to have to amputate, son. There's nothing else we can do. But he was very lucky because he met one of these researchers out there who is involved with this pixie dust peptide. And he said to him, do you want to try this peptide? So the soldier says, well, what's it involved? And he said, well, we've got to obviously keep your wound clean. Can't let it get infected. And then we're just going to put this powder on every day and then just wrap it up. And we'll do the same net tomorrow and the day after that. And the guy goes, well, why not? What have I got to lose? <laughs> OK, you can see that isn't perfect, right? But that regrew in six months. And the guy has bone, he has tissue, he has nerves, he has muscle, and he doesn't use a stick. He so why aren't leg. doctors doing this all over the world? <laughs> well, that's a $64 trillion question, isn't it? Is it only work with certain populations or is it very low chance of probability of success or it doesn't make any sense why um, you can do it? First of all, this is going on in the military and the, in my working career, wherever I've heard somebody say, as indeed the peptide bioregulators were, when everyone says to me, oh, this was a former military secret, I listen very, very carefully. I've heard it from French, I've heard it from Russian, and I've heard it now from the Americans, I've heard it from the British too. And I listen very carefully. And people say, how come the military can do this and yet it's not in the public domain, not even as uh, a, 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 in a trial? And my answer to that is, well, the military are the one group that have more guns than the FDA do. <laughs> so um, it's a long answer to that one, but. Let's be honest, there are lots of vested interests in this world. Dr. Jonathan Wright, who's a man I admire very much, he's based in, uh, in uh, Washington State in America. He has a big hospital. There's about 200 doctors working underneath him. And he has a whole team of university students who go down to the libraries in Seattle 
and dig out old information that people have forgotten about. And he's unearthed loads and loads and loads of things. And I once heard him tell an audience or ask an audience, um, how far do you think we are behind the literature? And of course, whatever we do today always has to be behind the literature because that's the cutting edge, right? It's not going to be available this year, next year. But people shouted out 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And his answer was, from his experience and his knowledge, he reckons we're 100 years behind the literature. That's crazy. Right? That's too, too long. I, <laughs> it seems I that, uh, maybe. feel alive by then. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so we're, <laughs> we're practicing 1921 medicine. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's shocking. That's shocking when we, we consider how we always say that medicine is moving so quickly, we're advancing like crazy, we've, you know, so much technology, and to think we're Surgery still does. behind. Surgery does, but therapeutics don't. And the reason is, according to Jonathan Wright, that surgeons don't have a governing FDA. Mm. They they literally get together amongst themselves and they say, do you know what? Last time I was doing this operation, I did this and this. And do you know, oh, it's all so much better. Well, oh, I'll, I'll try that. And then the next thing is it's in the literature and, and all the surgeons are adopting it. So surgery is moving on at quite a pace. But therapeutics is really being so many. I mean, I was speaking to some British doctors not long ago who were close to retirement. And I asked them about the drugs that they prescribe today. And they both said that the drugs they prescribe today, 80% of them were the same drugs that they prescribed when they left medical, medical school in the 1960s. <laughs> wow, <laughs> we are behind, we're really behind. So I'm gonna to have to let you go, Phil. It's um, now almost two hours. So if anybody has any last minute questions, please ask. Um, and I found this a fascinating discovery, a fascinating discussion. I really would like people to look more into what you're sharing in, in Age, Aging Matters magazine. You can find that on, online as well as the Lifespan Medicine Journal. And why not become a part of the British Longevity Society? I did. And, um, and go look at Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, always anti-aging systems. And the anti-aging dot store is where you can find all these peptides we talked about. Anyways, thank you so much, everyone who, who showed up, who stuck around. Everyone just stuck around. That's amazing. Um, that just shows, yeah, you had some pretty interesting stuff to share. Thank you so much for your time, Phil. I hope thank we can you. Again. Thank you, Zora. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.